Good morning. My name is Jeremy Sampson from Interbrand Sampson, uh, the global uh, branding group. And uh, it's been my pleasure to talk at USB this morning about the top 100 best global brands around the world. Uh, and so enjoy the presentation, which also touches on the green brands as well as the top brands by value. Thank you. Last year we talked about best global brands and this year we're going to talk a little bit about green brands as well just to begin with because I think that's a subject now which is of much greater interest uh, and that's the global spread. So that uh, Interbrand as you can see is about 40 offices around the world and that's a real network. Um, and the fact that we talk about brands, it's managing, creating the whole aspect of branding. You've got this Catherine wheel effect that branding is a continuum. Branding is all about all these various aspects. We might rebrand a local hardware store, because we don't do just do big jobs, but here's a country that's being rebranded. Uh, so Kenya, um, as a country, decided to freshen up its identity, its look, its rebranding. We did a lot of research. They've started dribbling out the launch, and they haven't properly formally launched it, so you can see how it's going to be looking. ATA, I mentioned last year that we had done the strategy and the naming for ATA, you know, a brand which Telcom uh, produced, and this was a rollout that we did. Um, it's interesting as well because um, when you do a brand work, you create a brand identity manual, but you also create a mood book to explain to people what are the values of the brand, how should it stand, what is the tone of voice, and these sorts of things. This was a finalist for the Lurie Awards um, three weeks ago, the main creative awards in South Africa. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about green brands. This is the first ever global rankings of green brands. What we've used are the best global green brands rankings and then put together a series of touch points, over 80 touch points with Deloitte to measure each brand, what it's doing in the field of sustainability, environmental as aspects. So I'm going to hop through because one of the things we do is we look at performance elements, that is actual areas like governance, uh, like stakeholders, looking at operations, etc. And then you can look at perception elements, authenticity, relevance. But in a lot of this work, we find there is a perceptual gap. So in putting the chart up, um, you can see that Toyota came number one this year. So this is the first ranking ever. There is a perceptual gap, which you can see top right there. All these companies are industrial companies for the most part, or not the fast-moving consumer goods. Toyota came out at the top, but you know, when you look down the line there, perhaps some of those companies will be a surprise to you. And then you can see the gaps, what's going on between the perception and the reality. Coca-Cola has been making very big efforts the last few years, um, as has GE, um, especially on the carbon footprint side. And I mentioned L'Oreal as being particularly active at the moment and taking the moral high ground. We also talk about sometimes the environmental aspects of countries. So that's just a quick run through of the first rankings of the, the green brands. Now I'm going to move on to best global brands. You can see that just in the States, um, CEOs say this is the third most important ranking they look for. Yet we find the financial media in South Africa, for the most part, does not cover the story. When you actually think about reputation today, reputational issues with companies, and that to a lot of people means the corporate brand, it's all interlinked. And reputation is crucial today because we say, well, brands are everything. And the fact that uh, Interbrand has been doing this since the 80s, they produced this with the British accountants. Twelve years ago, they produced this document. And you can see the sort of people who are looking now at the values of brands because it's of great significance. In mergers and acquisitions, these sorts of things, you might look at the tangible assets. But if you were to buy or try and buy a company like Google, what are its tangible assets? Probably less than 5 or 10% of its, all its assets. So we look at the financial role of brand, and is the brand strong or weak in its sector? Remember, of course, a lot of the numbers come from the clients. So they're not our numbers. We'll help them make assumptions, uh, but they factor in how they're seeing things. But it's now been split out. So this is the first time I've shown this to you. Um, and so you have the eternal effectiveness and the clarity of the brand, the commitment, the protection, the legal aspects. This is a huge thing. I, I get involved now as an expert witness on legal issues. On the external side, how different 
This is a brand, as you know, has got to be different. It mustn't be one of the crowd. It's got to stand out in some ways. Is it relevant today? Is it authentic? And then the executive side, the execution side, consistency, presence, and understanding. And out of this sort of scorecard, we can mark a brand, compare it with uh, its peers, perhaps in South Africa, or by global best practice. Um, also, just to stress again the, the integrity of uh, Interbrand system, because there are other systems around now. The research house Millwood Brown has got brands, uh, which they've been uh, drawing up for about the last four years or so, which are global. And then there's another company, Brand Finance, run by a guy called David Haig, who used to work for Interbrand. He, in fact, was on our team when we valued SAB in the late 1900s. Here's the ISO certificate of Interbrand, and they're the first company to have got this, and this was the end of last year. So let's go on to the best global brands. And so last year, and you can see the date there, the closing bell, the guy in the middle with the red tie, that's Jez Frampton, the CEO of Interbrand. So he was there for the closing bell. This year, last Tuesday, he was there for the opening bell. So New York Stock Exchange regards this as very, very important. Yet the South African media don't cover it. So there's the top 100 brands. So let's look at the top 10. A lot of you will remember that Coca-Cola has been the top brand for the last 12 years. What is it, 72 odd billion US dollars. IBM is closing in, Microsoft challenging. Now they've dropped down to third. Google has moved into fourth place. GE 5, McDonald's 6, Intel 7, Apple 8, Disney 9, and Hewlett Packard 10. What would you say is the average age of those top 10 brands? Right. Coca-Cola, 125 this year. IBM, 100 this year. Google is 13 this year. So if you add up those 10, it comes to 66.6. .6. So that's the age, the average age of those brands. So Coca-Cola, only up 2%, but 72 billion. Look at that bottom line. They serve 1.7 billion drinks every day. They're everywhere around the world, so they have the spread. And that's where, when we look at the brand strength of a brand, if it's only active in one country or one region, for the most part, we don't put it into the top 100. IBM is very much business to business. You can see it's now up to nearly 70 billion. It's getting very close to Coke. Microsoft seems a little bit, well, there, and still incredibly powerful and incredibly strong, but not doing too much. I lost a little bit of ground in the last year. Google up 27%. General Electric, and General Electric doing some work on the sustainability area, where Jeff Immelt, after Jack Walsh, retired. McDonald's up 6%. It's having a good recession. Um, people need to eat. Intel, I think, very much an enigma. You know, how much do you see? You know, occasionally you see the in Intel inside. Apple, 58% in 12 months. Number nine, Disney. And then Hewlett Packard. I guess the story of Hewlett Packard ours is uh, four chief executives in two years. So that's quickly the top, the top ten. The bottom ten, Heineken, UBS, who I predict will be off the top hundred by this time next year. Luxury brands like Armani, financial groups like Zurich, the old SA Eagle in South Africa, Burberry, the London fashion brand. Um, and you can see how Starbucks, which we don't have here, John Deere, HTC from Taiwan, Ferrari, and Harley-Davidson. And th the top 10 rises, as you, as you would be guessing, perhaps, Apple at the top. But we haven't talked about Amazon. And Amazon is having a fantastic time. So interesting how it's all fitting together. You can go down to Google in third place, Samsung. Samsung is the 17th biggest brand. And then the fifth largest, Burberry. So Apple, as I say, up 58%. What's been going on there has been incredible. I don't know how many of you are investors here, and I'm sure a lot of you dabble in the stock exchange or whatever, but if I said to you 10 years ago, one Apple share, do you know the value of one Apple share 10 years ago? The answer is $9. And the value today? 400. Look at that investment in a brand. Um, and you can see there back uh, in August, it was actually the most valuable company in the whole world, uh, topping ExxonMobil. 
Amazon, as we say, having an incredibly successful time. Google, we've talked a little bit about, you know, only 13 years old, uh, the founder, Larry Page, moving back in there um, to, to help bring it together, and Samsung, we've talked about. Burberry is interesting because, um, as a sector, the luxury brands have done pretty well in the last year. Now, a lot depends on the part of the world that they're really active in, but most of the major brands are global. And then the biggest decliners, Nokia. Now, five years ago, we would be talking of Nokia as the main brand. Nintendo, Sony, Yahoo, Dell, um, the brands that are suffering um, in very competitive areas. If you don't keep evolving, keep launching new things, you're going to slip away. And new entrants, HTC from Taiwan. So Taiwan has its first brand in the top 100. John Deere and Nissan, the automotive side, is, is very, very strong across the board. And then the countries that produce the top brands. No, America's in a mess, but they still have 50% of the top brands. The world is changing. Things are made all over the world from components that are brought together. 50% there, and then you can see there in Germany, 10%. Um, and that's largely because of the automotive. France, 7, which is largely luxury. Japan, 7. Switzerland, and so it goes down. It's interesting the countries that have one brand, because uh, Mexico has a beer brand. Finland, of course, is Nokia. And that one brand can make a huge impact on the economy of a country. And then we talk about the sectors, financial services, and that's been getting weaker and weaker. Then the report, we do a, a segmental analysis. So when you look at the media, look how media's changed in the last couple of years. Nowadays, most of the communication comes from each one of us. Whereas today, that conversation is, is it a text, is it an email, it's all these other things. So word of mouth has been amplified. Often we read things on Twitter, on Facebook, and depending on who they come from, we believe it, don't we, for the most part. This apparently is the new big thing, the cloud mentality, iCloud, it's the sort of thing Steve Jobs was talking about increasingly before his death. And uh, this is where whatever's happening now, is it going to slow down? I don't think so. The financial services world, um, in chaos, there's a sea change going on. You know, lots of people going overseas, getting perhaps degrees, a lot of you are taking degrees here, but then you can't get a job, so what are you doing? You're going back home or you're staying at home, and hopefully that'll be good for those economies. Luxury you've talked about, retail is interesting. Uh, last year people were asking, I think in this room as well, what about Walmart? Well, what about Walmart? We need jobs in this country desperately. At the moment, the government is driving away inward investment. Now, as I say, for three ministries to be challenging Walmart, that's money that's being used to fund that and pay for lawyers that comes out of our pockets. So what are the highlights from the last year? Coca-Cola versus IBM, yes. Apple, HTC. One of the things about brands is the stability. Now, the fact that Coca-Cola in 12 years can stay there, I think, shocks a lot of people. That's the value of the top 100 brands last year. So that's $1 trillion. So what's it done in the last 12 months? 4.6%. So that wouldn't have been a bad return, perhaps, in the last 12 months. But that's the reality of investing with top brands. If you'd had one share in each of those top 100, they would have gone up 4.6%. But no, we would argue that shows the strength of brands. Um, if you invest in a company, you want to know that that company has a future. We would argue if it's got strong brands, it has a future, because people will be loyal, they'll keep going back to those brands. Um, whereas if the company doesn't have strong brands, or you have a lot of choice, you'll stop doing that. And I'm going to stop at that point and ask some questions. Thank you.